Good evening, all. Welcome to Introduction to Philosophy. I'm Dr. Ryan Lozano. I will be your instructor. Uh, so how we're going to go about this is we'll actually be doing videos for about every other lecture instead of doing uh, every single one. I'll be posting these on Tuesday. Uh, and so tonight, or I'm sorry, I'll be posting these on Thursday. Tonight, what we're going to take a look at is Pythagoras and the Pre-Socratics. Now, we don't need to focus a whole lot on Pythagoras himself. Uh, but really, we need some information from him so we can get to our pre-Socratic philosophers. So what I'm going to do is just kind of go down these things, and uh, you can follow along in your lecture notes there. So what we need to understand, at, first of all, about Pythagoras is that he felt that the ultimate reality, whatever it was, whatever made up everything, had to be abstract, so not too specific, kind of malleable, had to be able to fit everything. But it also had to be relational, had to relate to me, to this stained glass window, to the fan behind me, to those wooden pillars and all that kind of stuff. It's got to be able to relate to everything. And he said it depends on number, specifically the first four integers, one, two, three, and four. I have the same combination on my luggage. And he said that these were quasi-divine generating entities. In other words, sort of godlike things, entities, that make stuff, generating. Now... Pythagoras is going to influence a lot of people that come after him, most specifically Socrates, uh, who we'll get to shortly, as he's depicted in the dialogues of Plato. And so the notion here is that whenever we investigate natural phenomena, we're always going to lead generally to the abstract. So that is to say, if I tell you to picture an animal, uh, specifically a mammal, well, that could be a lot of things. It could be a small mouse, it could be a blue whale. They're both mammals in the general sense of the word, and so we have to abstract some of the details about them. It has fur, bears live young, um, you know, things like that. And yes, whales do in fact have fur in very limited quantities. Uh, and so that's going to be kind of the level of abstraction that we're dealing with with this. Now, as Pythagoras is growing up, before his birth, in fact, his parents took him to the Oracle of Delphi, and she said he would surpass all men in wisdom. In fact, he is the first one to actually abrogate to himself the title of philosopher, which is a lover of wisdom. We know that he spent many years traveling, possibly in Egypt, where he picked up base, base 10 mathematics, possibly spent time in India. Uh, seems to have encountered uh, some Persians because he has ideas that we find uh, closely associated with the Magi, what we would call Zoroastrians, and seems to have picked up some ideas of asceticism and possibly even the transmigration of souls. Now, Pythagoras spent about 40 years traveling, and we returned to Greece, a cult had formed around him. We typically give cults kind of a negative connotation. We don't like the idea of, of being in a cult or being associated with a cult, but really it just means care of, like agriculture is care of the agri, care of the fields. So, this group had devoted itself to trying to care for him, for his ideas, for his memory, and so on and so forth. So we begin this idea that on the one hand, we've got this very Pythagorean approach that's abstract and transcendent. And then when we get over to Aristotle in a couple of weeks, we're going to find this very naturalistic thought. These things aren't necessarily at odds with one another, but they are definitely different ways of approaching the same problem. So Pythagoreanism, <clears throat> says that reality was created out of something that wasn't itself material, but had to be architectonic for everything material. Now, what he means by that is that whatever reality is comprised of, um, it has to be something that can be measured in some way, shape, or form. This something is an abstract plan or idea on which all further reality is going to be suspended. And constructed. Now he's going to use the word, and we're going to see this fairly frequently, telos. Telos is a Greek word that means something like plan, aim, goal, design, or outcome. Uh, it means a lot of those things. So it's T-E-L-O-S. And something is teleological if it connotes a plan. So walking into this house, this had a plan, a blueprint specifically. And the carpenters and the glassmakers and whomever else worked on this place knew that they would have to follow that plan for what they were developing to resemble what it was supposed to. Now, for Pythagoras, this is number. Number is what allows all things to become accessible to our senses. So, for instance, I have here 
two envelopes. They're probably bills, so I'm, I'm going to throw those away. But these are not representative of two any more than this is representative of two. There are two digits here, just as there were two envelopes, uh, just as there are my kids' two Kindles laying on my desk beside me. There are a number of things that we count that aren't themselves re representational of the number itself. If you think of two dogs, well, they represent dogs, not so much the number two, but two is what we would use to describe them. This may make a little bit of sense here in a little bit. So Pythagoras is writing on what he calls the sacred integers, one, two, three, and four, because they ground respectively the point, that's one, the line, the shortest distance between two points is a line, the plane, if we've got now got a third point, now we've got a planar object in the shape of what we would call a triangle, and if we add a fourth one to that, now we've got a 3D object, so a solid. And he says it's with these integers that the soul of the cosmos would generate the world of things. Now, the Greeks say soul an awful lot, and the word that they use for soul is psyche. So when we see soul in something that is written by the Greeks, we need to interpret that as mind. You see soul, you think mind. The reason that's so important is the mind of the cosmos is going to be what defines it, what describes it, how it identifies itself, how it relates to everything that's around us. Now, if we take this series of numbers, this one, two, three, and four, and we stack them up, it ought to be familiar to if you're a bowler, because we get 10. Specifically, we get a kind of pyramidal shape sort of thing with one at the top, two, three, and then four. Now, <clears throat> Pythagoras, we actually know for his Pythagorean theorem, which if you recall is a squared plus b squared equals c squared, or if we want to get really fancy, the square of the hypotenuse, which is the long side, is equal to the sums of the squares of the other two sides. Now, don't go away. I know, math is scary. That's about all the math that we're going to do. What we get in this, though, are the manifestations of sensible things. Sensible in this context, meaning those things that uh, we deal with our senses. We see them, taste them, touch them, hear them, smell them, and so forth. So if you think about music for just an instance, I am not a musician, but I am familiar with some, some concepts of it. If you take, say, a guitar string and you pluck it, you're going to get a certain note. If you then bisect that string, that is split it in half, just by pinching it off or pressing it against the frets, and pluck it again, it's going to be exactly one octave higher. If you bisect that bisection, so now we're down to a quarter, it's going to be an octave higher, an eighth an octave higher, a sixteenth an octave higher, and so on and so forth. So these are numerical relations that inhere in sensible things. So for Pythagoras, it's not coincidental that we hear these harmonious things that are going to be very important to us. Hang on just a moment. Yes. Yes, forgive me. Six-year-olds and recording lectures do not mix. Now, what Pythagoras understands here is that the soul, and remember, we need to think of that as mind, can naturally perceive cosmically harmonic things. So when we hear good music, we don't have to be trained as musicians to know that it is melodic, to know that it's rhythmic, to know that it's pleasing to us. The same is true when we hear bad music. We know that it sounds bad, not because we're trained, but because it just doesn't sound quite right to us. Now, what Pythagoras is inclined to say is that the same kind of relation is what's keeping the planets in their orbits as well, because creation itself is a harmonic thing that connotes of some sort of rational plan. Remember, telos, end, aim, plan, goal, design, or outcome. So it's something that is not necessarily material, but is completely rational. So Pythagorean medicine uses music as therapy or used music as therapy. So when you go to your doctor's office or your chiropractor or your dentist or whatever, they're probably playing something, you know, easy listening, elevator music, Kenny G. My doctor plays Slayer, but he's a little bit strange. So the reason they do that is because they don't want you all agitated. You know, if they're playing something that's very up-tempo, it's going to get you in an up-tempo state of mind. Maybe you feel like dancing. If they're playing something that's kind of calm and a little bit serene, it's likewise going to calm you down. 
This is something that, again, is not material, but is definitely relational. Okay, so let's skip ahead a little bit. There's this wonderful kind of correspondence between matter and abstraction, and this is something that Pythagoras is really going to be interested on. Um, so, for instance, we now know that sound travels in waves. As I am speaking towards the microphone on my webcam, it's kind of undulating towards it, it's bouncing off it, it's reverberating back to me, as well as everything in this room. Now, we know that we could put, say, some sort of filter in between those two things, and that's going to block some of that sound, or muffle it a little bit, or it's going to take it a little bit longer to go. Now, the theory was that sound was visible in waves a very long time ago, and it really wasn't proven until about the late 1950s. So this is one of those things where matter and abstraction really kind of come to overlap one another. If we take this creative force and think about these things, we kind of see that sort of where Pythagoras was coming from, that number is a kind of divinity. Uh, if you're following along in the slides, on slide 23, what you've got is uh, what's called a Fibonacci spiral. Uh, so a Fibonacci sequence is something that's, uh, that's to do with kind of a, some advanced mathematics and really just sort of a fun thing to play with. But the spiral that you see here goes from 1 to 2 to 3 to 5 to 8 to 13 to 21 to 34. And each of those elongates a little bit in its sequence, just making up for volume. It's interesting, though, that we find this exact same relation, this Fibonacci spiral, in nautilus shells, things that are found in nature. We might also think of back in geometry class when we had to prove, ugh, geometry proofs were yucky, where we had to use pi. Pi is 3.14 repeating all the way as far as we know, but it's one of those things that while we need it, while we find it in nature, it's not something that we would just rationally stumble upon. Uh, same thing would be like the square root of negative one, something that we call i, an imaginary number. So we need these things, and math seems to be out there. Now, for the Pythagoreans, this can't be a coincidence. There's got to be something more to it. So this ultimate plan, remember telos, has got to be abstract, so malleable enough to fit a bunch of different things, but also capable of generating physical reality. It has to be something that we're able to wrap our minds around in such a way that we can understand it very clearly and carefully. This abstract plan is also a plan of relationships. Now, if we talk about what kind of governor was Pythagoras, not a very good one. Uh, but politics and philosophy, while they overlap quite a bit, a good philosopher is probably not going to be a great politician. What we're looking for, and what Aristotle is going to tell us in a couple of weeks, is we really only should seek precision so long as whatever we're studying allows for it there's not a Pythagorean theorem or even a mathematical approach to the political life. A philosophically guided state probably isn't gonna survive the reality in which it finds itself. And so what do we get about him being a first philosopher? He was interested in things of a higher order, not necessarily practical things, but really wanted to try and find the meaning of life that we might say, which of course we know is 42. Now, an inquiry Serving the purposes of knowledge is really what makes you a philosopher in this context. And that kind of leads us in <clears throat> to our next subject of discussion, which is the pre-Socratics. They wanted to know what is there. What they're doing is what's called cosmological philosophy. The cosmos is not just a Neil deGrasse Tyson show, uh, and it was actually better with Carl Sagan, the, the old host from the 70s, but I digress. Cosmos means universe in Greek. So cosmological thought, kind of like teleological, means it has to do with a plan. Cosmological means it has to do with the cosmos, has to do with existence. So if you were to think for just a moment about how many different kinds of stuff are there, there's water, certainly, and there's also air and fire and gold and earth and wood and all sorts of different things have been posited as these are the primary elements. Sometimes it's four, sometimes it's five, sometimes it's seven. Really doesn't matter. Would it be possible to reduce everything, and I mean everything, from the computer monitor that I'm in front of to the door over there to the fan behind me uh, to the insulation that's piled on the floor at present because I've still got to install it. Could we reduce all of this to just one kind of thing? one ultimate form of stuff, and that's really what they're interested in. Now, what we're getting into here is what's called metaphysics. Meta is a Greek prefix that means after, through, transcending, adjacent to, or beyond. <clears throat> so 
beyond the physical. You remember physics. Physics was that class in high school where you spent the whole semester rolling balls off tables and snapping each other with rubber bands, maybe making paper airplanes, stuff like that. This is stuff that's going to be developed in the fourth century by Aristotle, fourth century BC by Aristotle, but it had already been founded earlier by other Greek philosophers. So metaphysics involves two connected and distinguishable questions. The first is the question of what there is, what really exists. And second, how are we able to know such things? So how can we have any kind of Congress with what is and what doesn't exist? If it doesn't exist, can we know about it? How we go about them is either going to be defensible, that is, we can back it up, or it's going to be hopelessly defective. Now, the first of those questions, what there is, that's what we call ontology, from the Greek ons ontos, being or existence. The second is epistemology. Episteme is one of the many Greek words for knowledge, specifically a scientific sort of knowledge. So how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to do this through the lens of some pre-Socratics who are doing this cosmological thought in an attempt to discern what really is. So they want to know things probably like we want to know things. Is knowledge relative? Are there certain things that I know in such a way that you couldn't possibly know them? Well, it may seem like this at the outset of this class, but that's certainly not the case. Never fear. Does knowledge come from God or the gods? Why does knowledge seem to differ from people to people? Uh, We're in an election year, which is fabulously entertaining to watch. These are people that ostensibly are faced with the exact same evidence, you know, the situation of the country, uh, the reality of the coronavirus, all of these other things, but they're facing it in radically different ways, or rather they're suggesting that we face it differently, and they're approaching it very substantively different. How are we going to approach things like this when we think about knowledge? So metaphysics derives from Aristotle and means after the physics or after we study natural science. So after we finish with our biology, our chemistry, our physics, and so on, what else is there still to study? Well, quite a bit, as it turns out. And it asks two questions. What is there, and how do I know what there is? So the first question is ontological. That is, it wants to know what constitutes reality itself. For example, do our minds exist, or our thoughts? What about those times when you learn something? Say you're studying something. Maybe you're studying for a history test, and you know that on this date this happened, and it led to this, and so on and so forth and you sit down to take your test in your history class, maybe you've got one of those examination blue books, and your mind completely blanks. Where does that knowledge go? Does it disappear? Does it go to that 90% of our brain that we don't use, supposedly? Where does it go? And then later that night, possibly in the middle of the night, especially if you're one of those people that stays awake late thinking, it's a curse, all of that knowledge floods back to you. It's such pristine clarity that you could write the textbook for it. The knowledge that went away during the test when you needed it most now is there again. And now you're faced with what do you know and how do you know it? So how do you even go about answering questions like these? Our observations aren't enough. There seems more to reality than is accessible to our senses. Now Pythagoras had given us that abstract, relational, and ultimately rationalistic method for answering ontological questions. It was intuitive to a great sense. Intuition, just a gut feeling. It seems to be like this. It makes sense for it to be like this, so we just kind of go with it. Empirical observation, beyond you know the two envelopes or the two whatevers, didn't really play a large part in this. So now we've got two methods to approach knowing what exists we're left with this task of choosing between them. We've got the rational method that's gonna give us an account of reality, but it may not be supported by the empirical, what we see, taste, touch, hear, smell, and so on. Which one do we prefer and on what basis do we choose? So we know that ontology is gonna deal with questions of what exists. Think of it as kind of like a hierarchy. Remember when you were in high school biology class and you ordered, you learned kingdom class order of phylum genus species. I think a couple of those were out of order, but it doesn't matter because I don't teach biology. When you were learning that stuff, you were grouping it in those hierarchies as a way to tell these things are similar, these things are different, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> now for epistemology, 
I would like you to picture a Venn diagram and you have one for you on slide 39 if you're following along in this. Epistemology is how we claim to know things. So is reality one thing or a bunch of things? Are all of our realities, those of us participating in this class, do they overlap or do they happen simply to come up every once in a while, completely independent of each other, and it's completely chance that we're here together? To ask what there is, is always to know how there is. So picturing our Venn diagram, we've got our two circles. They're gonna overlap in such a way. One of these circles is truth, and one of these circles is belief. Where they overlap, we're going to call that slim section of overlap, knowledge. Now the problem that we encounter with this is human beings are a very credulous species. Think of all of the crazy things that people believe. Spend a few minutes on the internet or standing in line at the DMV, you will discover all the crazy things that people believe. So our belief circle is huge, roughly the size of this house. Our truth circle is roughly the size of our wedding band, my wedding band, which I forgot to put on this morning. Nobody told my wife. Now, where they overlap then is going to be very, very narrow. We're going to have just a shade of what we can actually call knowledge. Now, that's going to be the key problem in epistemology. Further, if we say that our senses deceive us, if they're incapable of reaching certain levels of reality, that itself is an epistemological claim. We're saying we can't necessarily believe everything we see, hear, taste, touch, feel, and so on. If we know that our senses deceive us, there's gotta be some kind of non-deceptive, non-perceptual mode of discovery that we can weigh the evidence that our senses give us. So how are we going to do this? <laughs> Is this, and that was my son. Sorry. Is this logic? Is this mathematics? Is it possibly science or possibly religion? So we've got, and those are just four out of, you know, innumerable possibilities. May I have a question? Yes, you may. Okay. These are questions of epistemology, meaning that we study, we critique, and we refine our knowledge of our very modes of knowing. Now, most of our most significant claims are actually beliefs rather than knowledge. If you're following along in the slides, on slide 42, you've got a picture of Little Orphan Annie, the musical. If you haven't seen the Little Orphan Annie, you are remiss, you need to see it right away. Now, if we think of the key song from that musical, the little orphan comes out and she says, the sun will come up tomorrow, or out tomorrow, I don't know. So we gotta hang on for tomorrow. And the epistemologist says, bullshit, that little ginger lied to us. In fact, we have no guarantee that the sun will come out tomorrow. Is it highly likely that the sun will come out tomorrow? Would it be a fairly safe bet that the sun will come out tomorrow? Probably yes. But we really can't know if the laws of physics are going to be operant tomorrow in the same way that they are today. So what makes that different than just making a sideways ass guess about something, a swag, if you will? we have what we call epistemic justification on the side of belief that the sun will come out tomorrow. And that's kind of giving us that we've got enough epistemological and empirical evidence that we can probably safely say, yes, the sun will in fact come out tomorrow. And so we've got these two branches of metaphysics. We've got ontology, we've got epistemology, and they're inextricably bound up with one another. So to answer the question, what is there? Well, we've already adopted a method for deciding. To adopt a method is to have already taken a position of sorts on the kind of things that that method might uncover, the kinds of answers that we might be led to. But it's not just in philosophy, really, that we're confronted with these sorts of things that tax our intellectual resources. In daily life, we've got ontological and epistemological type questions. Should I believe everything I read in the newspapers? Well, probably not, because Hardly anybody reads newspapers anymore. Should I have CNN on this monitor and Fox News on this monitor and wherever they overlap, I can reasonably accept that as the truth? Might be, but it sounds kind of taxing. What medical advice is really sound? If you watch the advertisements for various prescription drugs and even toothpaste, they never have 10 out of 10 doctors agreeing. Nine out of 10 doctors seem to think that one out of 10 doctors is an idiot and not to be believed. Do you die with your body or might there be something kind of like a life after this one? Is there such a thing as goodness? Now this last one I think is particularly compelling as an ethicist. I have to wonder, are we ever really good to one another 
Or every once in a while, does my selfishness and your selfishness overlap in such a way that we can say that a good thing has taken place? These are real problems and good questions. As we start supplying answers to these questions, we find we've already adopted a method and we might discover the answers we've reached were more or less guaranteed by the method we chose. If we choose, for instance, a mathematical method, we're only going to accept those answers that meet up with mathematical certainty, which is going to be kind of tough. If we meet a logical method, we're going to find those answers that are logically viable, what we're going to call true. You know, those things where valid premises have led to, pardon me, have led to valid conclusions and we can say, yes, we know these things. And so on and so forth with the, uh, the religious approach and the scientific approach and so on. Now, the real question is what does have real existence? And one of the ancient Greeks, a guy named Democritus of Abdera, gave a materialistic answer. Democritus said that everything is essentially atomic. That should sound very familiar to you because that's basically what our modern theory says, is that everything is ultimately atomic. That everything that makes up the universe are these invisibly small particles. We're going to call them atoms. Now this seems counterintuitive. It doesn't seem to make sense because if we get back to our thoughts and our minds, We've got dreams, we've got desires, we've got thoughts, we've got sensations. Are these atomic? Now, the ancient atomists took a firm position. They said, yes, everything that exists by nature of its existence must be atomic. And here's why that's actually easier to do that way. If we say that certain things are not, such as our thoughts, our feelings, our actions, our attitudes, we have to draw a very firm line somewhere and say, up to this point, these things are atomic. Beyond this point, these things are not atomic. That's really difficult to do. That would recall or require us to redraw that line with fair regularity, and it's something that we're probably not terribly compelled to do. So what they would say is everything, because it's easier that way, everything is ultimately reducible to that atomic level. And that does make it easier when we think about those things that we've studied and somehow forgotten when they do come flooding back, or we're trying to think of a line from a movie, lyrics from a song, a certain quote, or the name of, I don't know, someone that we met at some point in time. It was there, it's lost, it comes back, really falls on the side of everything being atomic rather than the opposite. Now, just because we can reduce it down, doesn't mean it can't still be complex because the configurations of atoms can result in all kinds of things from you know pill bugs outside to houses like this to wood grains and all kinds of stuff but these collections are largely ephemeral that is they're not lasting when the forces that hold these things together become weakened they suffer either through injury disease atomic structure breakdown all kinds of things so the ancients had a number of different takes on it that really don't seem all of all that odd to us now. Thales said, everything is water. And given that the human body is basically 95% water, we're essentially cucumbers with anxiety. Anaximander said everything was an indefinite and boundless realm. Anaximenes, these are great names, aren't they? Start naming your kids these things, bring it back. Anaximenes said that everything is air. Okay. Pythagoras said it was numbers, might have seemed strange then, now seems every bit as normal as the rest of these. Heraclitus said that everything is fire, creating and destroying almost simultaneously. What then about the soul? And of course, remember when the Greeks say soul, they really mean mind. How many kinds of this particulate atomic stuff <clears throat> have to be assumed in order to account for everything that exists? And the materialists would say, don't go that far, matter. Matter is all that has to exist in the form of those atoms. If we go back to atomism, if what there is goes beyond our senses, how can we discover this existence in the first place? The atoms have to come together in large enough assemblages for us to be accessible to them through our senses. We've got to be able to see them, hear them, taste them, smell them, and so on. Now, as these things take on different properties, we're going to see different things about them. Does this extend, for instance, into our realm of morality? Are there really such things as beauty and ugliness or right and wrong? You know, we might say that beauty is in the eye of the beer holder. To raise these questions triggers further questions because, welcome to philosophy, what are the means by which those answers are going to be found? And is the method that we use to identify them itself right or wrong? 
Now, some of this is kind of a conditioned response. If for instance, um, let's see, uh, several months ago I was in a natural history museum and I saw tattooed faces of the indigenous Maori tribe from New Zealand. And their tattoos were beautiful to me. But also several months ago, I saw in the news a member of the MS-13 gang and his facial tattoos were really ugly and disturbing to me. Now, both had facial tattoos. Both were associated with kind of a prevailing ethos of their community. Um, both were indicative of their status within their respective tribe or gang or whatever you like. Um, and both were intended to convey a message to the people who saw them. Why would I think the one was good and the other one was bad? Well, because of the cultural associations that I form around them. So this is going to be one of those difficult things. It's part of social conditioning. Uh, if there's the little old lady who lives in the house on the corner and has 37 cats, now we just think, okay, you know, that's your thing. You're Karen, you know. If, however, she was in the 1600s with the house on the corner and all the cats, she's probably a witch and we had better burn her prophylactically. Now, the ancient Greek philosophers were perfectly well aware of this dilemma. The pre-Socratics said, I don't know if we can ever divorce ourselves of our prejudices in this. Now, today we usually encounter, we usually associate um, prejudice with like racial things or sexual things, but it doesn't have to be. It certainly ought not to be, especially for our purposes. When we say prejudices, you know, we've got all kinds of things based on our education, on our religious beliefs, on our political beliefs, on where we grew up, on the culture that we come from, on all kinds of things. I mean, we could have a prejudice against left-handed people, you know, got to have their own special scissors, always scribbling across the sheet when they write. It's weird. I don't actually have that prejudice though, so, so don't worry. Protagoras, who's going to show up later in the dialogues of Plato, said that man is the measure of all things. And ladies don't feel left out of this, man in the sense of anthropos, men, women, humans, people, us. So inclusive sense of man. In this way, each person's individual experiences and perceptions constitute reality for that person. Now, this might be easiest to think about in our taste in movies and music in food. Um, I like really, really spicy food. But I have friends whose concept of spicy is somewhere between ketchup and a communion wafer. Really, really bland. Where are we going to find those differences? If I say this is really good food, chances are it's going to have a lot more flavor than what they think is really good food. Pythagoras would say, we're both right, because we are the measure of all things. Now, this probably isn't dangerous if we're talking about food. But if I decide that the proper way to greet people instead of extending my hand for a handshake and yes, I still shake hands, even in the Rona, is to punch them in the face, that's probably not going to catch on, and they're probably not going to be swayed to my point of view. Now, what Protagoras is saying here is that judgments of any sort, moral right and wrong, aesthetic beauty and ugliness, must have some kind of grounding, and the only grounding they can possibly have is my experience gained over a lifetime. I can't have an epistemic position external to my own individuality because... I couldn't comprehend it. I only know the world and my experience of it as me. So in this light, epistemology becomes really a fit subject for kind of cultural anthropology or sociology. We're examining the extent to which certain social and cultural values shape our metaphysics and our metaphysical speculations. Truth turns out to be perceptions and perspective of the individual rather than some objective or transcendent or eternal state. And that has some really significant problems. Um, <clears throat> the fact that we measure our lives and hours kind of sets a limit on what we can know. We only have so much time to get this stuff and know it and do it and get it done. In this way, then, each person kind of becomes this measure of all things and the possibility of this coherent transpersonal body of knowledge is beyond our reach. And really, the, the contribution of these pre-Socratic philosophers to this takes on the form of these robust skeptical challenges to believe. So Socrates, which we're getting into next, he's gonna examine these beliefs, but he's also gonna get into the challenges. He says, well, what he does ultimately is he shifts our philosophical attention from the cosmos to the human condition itself. He says it really doesn't matter what the cosmos is comprised of, whether it's air, water, an indefinite boundless realm, number, whatever. That's not important. What makes us the way that we are? 
what takes us, these fallible creatures that seem to be in charge of our planet, for better or for worse, and makes us think in the ways that we do. What, Pythag what Socrates is going to argue, what Protagoras is going to argue, or rather Socrates, is that, not, that each of us not only fails to be the measure of all things, but we also are generally fairly poor in understanding ourselves. This is kind of where we leave off today. Uh, we're going to pick up with more of this when we meet again, or we meet virtually, or you choose to watch the next video, or what have you. Uh, but let me know your thoughts. If you've got some, some interesting questions about these, by all means, post them in the class discussion board, and we will go from there. So that's all from me. Hope you have a great day. Bye-bye.